Hey, 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 what's up? Thanks for coming back to the Undeserved Flavor. Come along with me on this little drive. I drive a lot, so you'll see me driving a lot. Figured I'd take this opportunity to talk about something I've been thinking about, and that is we keep overcomplicating everything. Scripture, God, our theology, our dogma, you know, like, <clears throat> what do I mean? Well, I was just watching a video, someone talking about God's will versus God's perfect will versus God's plan versus our free will. You know, and like, at what point does our free will have limitations or is our free will capable of completely overcoming God's will in the end and, you know, resulting in our eternal damnation? Well, it's like, you got to just stop overcomplicating. It's not that complicated. There is, you want to, you think you're going to die and go to heaven and be like, okay, God, I need you to explain something to me. Um, what's the difference between your perfect will and your permissive will? Or what's, or where does my free will uh, find its limit against your plan, your ultimate plan, or your predetermined whatever program? I think he'll just laugh. God is love, and that is the end of it. End of story, period. It's over. End. Telos. God is love. And God, well, that's it. I mean, inside of that, all other things live and move and have their being. If you overcomplicate it, you're going to take, you're going to lose sight. You're going to lose focus of what matters. You're going to miss the forest for the trees. Like when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees regarding the scriptures, like you, you search and search and search in the texts. In them, you think you're going to find life, you know, but essentially you missed the forest for the trees. I'm standing right in front of y'all, you know, and then they couldn't zoom out. They couldn't look and see the folly of their ways, the folly of their religiously overcomplicating everything um, because they were blinded by their tradition their greed, their power hunger, just whatever it was. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you, there, an argument could be made that God blinded them because, you know, God said that, uh, what, how did it go? He, uh, he set everybody up for failure so that he could show mercy to all. My paraphrase. Um, I mean, it, it's like, okay, moving on, I'm going to transition to another point. So don't over, overcomplicate the things of God, or you, you end up in a mess, you end up in arguments, you end up confused, you end up just missing the forest for the trees. Christ and Him crucified. Why did Paul say, I sought to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified when I was among you? Like, he did not try to figure out the you know all the details of the lit the liturgy and the, the, the church strategy the outreach strategy the evangelism strategy the you know the just the program it what none of that was relevant Christ and him crucified and what is Christ and him crucified it is the greatest display of other-centered self-giving love in all of history all of history and all of the future that is what Christ and him crucified is it's not some magic trick it's not some superstitious you know holy water you know like sprinkle the blood on something and watch it go poof you know and magic happens no it's don't overcomplicate it you're overcomplicating it stop overcomplicating it Making some superstition out of something that is very simple. Christ and Him crucified, what is it? It God incarnate saw the world that He made and He saw how 
hurt and destroyed we've become because of our blindness. He came to reveal his true nature and what it ultimately what was the conclusion what was the the pinnacle of his revelation or of his revealing himself the cross yeah there's the resurrection and without that you know there'd be no Christianity but my point right now is what was the the revealing the, the, the most important part of God coming to reveal himself in his nature to humanity it was Christ and him crucified that's it okay so now we know that there's no magic there's no superstition um, we'll move on to the resurrection because I did bring that up now that is where things can become magical or superstitious in appearance when you realize that there is power now this power isn't like bleed the blood and you know you, it's not some formula to um, get what you want or get what you need or think you need or like abracadabra alakazam you know be healed little man in the name you know what I mean like it's not a magic trick stop treating Christianity like a freaking witchcraft book it's not a magic trick it's not superstitious Christ and him crucified was God incarnate, a.k.a. a man in the flesh, like you and me, putting love on display. He didn't have anything extra. He didn't have anything you and I don't have. He had love for his fellow man, and he put it on display, and he didn't bend. He didn't crack. He went all the way. He laid his life down for his brothers and sisters. And in that, the world was able to see the nature of God. Now you want to start talking about extracurricular stuff like, <clears throat> well, you shouldn't be hanging out with gay people. Really? Who was Jesus hanging out with? Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, Jesus also hung out with Gentiles, <clears throat> hookers. Like, come on now. All right, so wrapping it all up here. I'm just rambling. This is a rambling video. I just came on here because I had seen a few things between social media and YouTube, just a few things that kind of got me going, thinking um, it's, you don't want to, oh, you keep, why overcomplicate everything? Now, all right, we're going to move on from there to transition to the next point I'm thinking about, and that is scriptural idolatry. Thou shalt not have any idols, any other gods. Or, you know, like, think of this. We, we made the Bible an idol. We've made the, the Bible a god, essentially. We've formed with our hands a god of... Uh, of an inanimate object. It's not the word of God. Do you understand that the logos of God, the, the whatever that Greek word is there that we translate into word <clears throat> doesn't actually mean word. Like there are certain languages, I believe Japanese is one of them, where they don't have the word word in the language. So they couldn't use that in translating the Bible into Japanese. They had to use something else. So what did they use? They used the term reasoning. In the beginning was the reasoning of God. Okay, well, can we call the Bible the reasoning of God? I guess in a way, but Jesus is the reasoning of God, the logos, the logic, the creative manifestation of God. The thoughts of God made manifest is Jesus Christ. He is the express image, the exact image, the full and complete, lacking nothing image of the invisible God. In whose image we have been made and fashioned. 
okay, so can could could God fall fall? Could God sin? Could God um, could Jesus have sinned if he wanted to? Yeah, I suppose he could have, but like we're created in his image and likeness. So whatever we're capable of, God is capable of, and vice versa. Whatever God's capable of, we're capable of, right? If you don't believe that, then you don't believe in the first you know, the first book of the Bible, the, the beginning. <clears throat> Let us create man in our image. Alright, going off trail. Alright, back to making things complicated. Things like the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Why do you gotta overcomplicate? What do we what's the point? Why do we have to put God in that box? Like that he's three and one, one and three. We can't comprehend that anyway. There's no mental gymnastics you can do. And if you do finally get to the point where you can say, I understand that concept, then what you've got is a human, a carnal understanding and you actually don't have it. You've actually put yourself in a box where you've limited yourself from something greater. So why do we have to have everything nailed down and like pinpointed into a definition? Why does God have to fit in your box? And why does it have to be a formula? Or why does it have to be a complicated, like, string of arguments? Or, you know what I mean? Like, why do we have to try and just, like, if someone's like, well, well, I guess it does. Arguments and formulas and dogma and theology and scripture, all that obviously comes into play when you're, when you're conversing, you know, and you're trying to see eye to eye with someone else who doesn't see eye to eye with you. Um, but ultimately, like, the one who can sit back and be quiet and just listen and realize there's no point in arguing, that's the one who's got it. That's the one who's going to, that's the one who's going to experience, you know, the greater peace. If you got to sit there and argue that guy's preaching of the devil. That guy's a, that guy's a heretic. That guy says God loves gays. That guy says God is going to save the Muslims even if they don't accept Jesus. What is the point of pointing all that out? Do you think you're saving anybody? Do you think you're doing God any favors? Who's building his church? Who's building his church? Are you building his church? No. Are you an apostle? No. Are you a prophet? No. Well, you might be, I guess, but I mean like all that ended, the apostles, the prophets, God gave some evangel uh, uh, evangelists, prophets, teachers, all that yada yada. That's old covenant. Now, we're the temple of God. We don't need apostles. We don't need prophets. When, when were the disciples first called apostles? They were referred to apostles in um, kind of extracurricularly because they simply carried the message. Like, apostle means messenger or sent one. Like, it's not overcomplicated. It's not like a title to be esteemed. Like, a 12-year-old girl can be an apostle if you tell her to go bring this message to, to that person over there. You know, like, it's not complicated. It's, heaven is not a hierarchical system. Church got that screwed up. Like, when we had it right was when we were meeting in the upper room, when we were meeting in people's houses, living rooms, not when we were p pulling from the Judeo uh, tradition and starting to form a liturgy and, you know, like, church died when it became a hierarchy, like when it became, when you, when you had to become qualified to speak in church. That's when the gospel lost its fire when we thought we needed to turn this into a system because we were too scared that some people were going to get deceived. We were scared of deception. You're scared of deception. If I want to go over and tell somebody who's gay that God loves them just the way they are, you're going to tell me I'm either preaching doctrines of demons or, and or I'm deceived. All right? Um, Mr. Biblio-idolater, um, if you got a seven-year-old kid and that kid starts showing 
some tendencies, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna feel? I understand there's gonna be some emotions, but if you are in, if you are powerless to change that kid or prevent that kid from becoming homosexual, let's say that kid's now 15 and you know they're they're going through their teenage rebellious years and you know they're not showing it to you because they don't want that shame because you've shamed them enough with your religious trash. I don't care how much you say you're a grace preacher or whatever. Like, you know, if that kid is war- if, if that kid is hiding at all in the smallest, you're the one that had the problem because you're the one that inflicted the shame that the gospel did not have anything to do with. It's your biblio-idolatry that ruined your kid for life. You, you're the one that sowed that seed of shame and guilt and torment. You can fix it. There's definitely, there's definitely uh, healing in the gospel. There's, there's healing in the, the power of the gospel. But for you to try and exclude anybody based on ancient literature that was written at a time when you were not there. You weren't there. That, that someone you're reading, not only are you reading someone else's mail, 2,000 year old mail, you, you, who are you to try to f- tell me, or anybody else for that matter, that you understand what that mail was talking about? The culture was so wildly different then. The things that were being addressed, like women staying silent, Paul talking about, I don't allow women to preach or teach. Um, there's a pretty good argument that he was referring to a specific small group of women who were specifically preaching and teaching about a pagan goddess. But you weren't there, so you'd never know that. Or should I say, you don't care to learn history, so that's why you don't know that. He wasn't telling people that women can't teach in church. He was talking about a certain particular small group, or maybe even, you know, a couple. Like a real small little, like, and not only that, but like not even to the church at large. Like, all these letters, has it ever dawned on you that the letters of the Bible were written to specific people for a reason? Like the, 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 the book of Corinthians... Why weren't the Romans reading that? Or why wasn't it addressed to the Romans and the Corinthians? Or the Ephesians and the Corinthians? Maybe because it was meant for the Corinthians and not for some American 2,000 years later? I'm not saying you can't get some wisdom out of it, but I am saying it ain't the Word of God. It ain't the living Word of God, incarnate, risen from the dead, it ain't Jesus. You can get some wisdom from it, but it ain't Jesus. He's shacked up inside of you. Now, listen. If you can cast down your idol of the scripture, and you can read this, then you can read the scriptures and actually like get them and get the wisdom that, that they do have in them. But if your priorities aren't straight, you're not going to have it. You're not going to read them right. Like, why do we have 43 some odd thousand denominations or sects of Christianity? Because everybody's arguing over the Bible. Nobody, you know, it's like, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I'm Bible only. The Bible is my, my authority, my final authority. Really? Well, that's kind of weird because it's actually like, a new concept like 200 years ago that wasn't being nobody said that well up until about 200 years ago nobody said that the Bible's my final authority it's a statement of faith yeah like John Crowder says you believe in the Trinity demon son and the Holy Bible you have put up an idol and it's got to come down. Are you going to miss the forest for the trees? Just like the Pharisees did. Just like the Pharisees did. And when people... Um, I'm, all right, I, there's something else I'm thinking about, but I'm not going to start naming names. I'm not going to go into a topic that I got onto on social media. 
If you got something to say about this, put it in the comments. I do appreciate you watching and listening. Um, other videos that I had intended, like my journey from from evangel evangelical to Christian universalist, that's still coming. Uh, I'm just really thinking through how I want to take the next video before I get to it. You know, good food takes time. But uh, I'd appreciate you hitting that subscribe, hitting the like button, and dropping a comment below, even if it's nothing crazy like, woohoo, you know, throw a comment down below. All right, y'all, have a good one. Taste and see that the Lord is good.